that to me is the power of the theater, the place of ideas, the hearing place. I mean, where else do you go where you have to you pay money and everyone listens? They pay to listen. You know, there's nowhere else on the planet where that happens. So let's get together as a community. Someone's going to give tell a story, probably have a different political point of view, and we're just going to take it. We're going to listen to it and figure it out. It's great stuff. That's actor Edward Giro, and this is Artworks, the weekly podcast produced at the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm Josephine Reed. Actor Ed Giro is a shining light in the Washington, D.C. theater community. Nominated for 16 Helen Hayes Awards and winning four, Ed began his career as an acclaimed classicist, playing Shakespeare on the D.C. stage in over 80 roles before moving seamlessly to contemporary work. Whether he's performing the passionate and valiant Hotspur in Henry IV, the uncompromising artist Mark Rothko in the play Red, a combative and charming Antonin Scalia in The Originalist, a role that was written for Ed, the blustering tycoon Harry Brock in the revival of Born Yesterday, or most currently, Tom Everson, a beleaguered factory owner who's fallen victim to a hostile takeover in Aid Akhtar's play, Junk. Edward Giro always delivers. His portrayal of characters is always authentic, precise, and incisive, whether he's drinking a beer or sipping wine from a goblet, carrying the play in the leading role or supporting another actor. Ed Giro richly inhabits each character, giving them texture, nuance, and emotional honesty. He is quite simply a mainstay of Washington, D.C.'s theater renaissance, But when he began his career nearly four decades ago, D.C. was not the theater town it is today. I wondered what brought Ed Giro from the New York area to D.C. I grew up in New Jersey, studied in Montclair State, moved into Manhattan, did my postgraduate work there with a private teacher, uh, got into a company. And in 83, actually in 81, I did a job for the Barter Theater in Southwest Virginia, and they asked me to stay. And in 82, the barter brought a season, six-week season, to George Mason University in Fairfax. And that night, we opened with a play called The Corn is Green. And opening night, John Neville Andrews, who at the time was the artistic director of the Folger Theater Group, came to see the show, walked downstairs to my dressing room and said, would you like to join the company? And I had been trained to do Shakespeare. I loved it. I couldn't believe this was happening. I said, by all means. So in 83, came down here for a season. They asked me back, and I thought, well, I can go back to New York and look for work or stay here and do the work I was trained to do, and I did. And soon after, Michael Kahn came, and the beginning of the Washington theater community began. Tell me what it was like to be in a theater company and how that's different from the way most actors have to work, which is, you know, going from theater to theater to theater. Yeah. I mean, there are not many companies. That was sort of the model I grew up thinking, you know, aspiring to, like, Stratford in Ontario or Oregon Shakes, so forth. Uh, and the Folger was one of the last of those companies. So we were about 12 of us who were hired for the whole season. And you do a range of plays. You might have a leading role, a small role. You'd rehearse during the day, perform at night, and spend the year. And, and what happens is, as artists, you become more aware of each other's work. You have sort of developed a shorthand. You become deep collaborators. Uh, and that's the kind of process that I... I love doing. And it was sort of the guild way of learning. I worked with people who were older, who were more seasoned. I would watch how they would work and say, I'll do it like that or I'll never do it like that. And you begin to develop a real team approach to doing the work. I would think, because even though obviously with any company there are people who are, who are more prominent than others, nonetheless, the way roles are just distributed and you can be a lead today and you can be... Yeah, walk in, on a small a cameo on, or exactly, the next night. Yeah, exactly. Night. Yeah, you play Barnardine in, in, in Measure for Measure, and then the next night you're playing Henry V. And that's the way I was trained to work and hoped I would be able to work. And then after so, so, several years, I uh, began to move back into more contemporary work. You know, I, I did every Shakespeare play at the Folger for 10 years and, I, you know, and didn't do anything else. A mo- movie here and there. Before we go to contemporary work, yeah. what was it like playing Shakespeare? Different plays all the time. To me, that would have been heaven. Oh, it was. I mean, it, it, I, I love it. Shakespeare is my sort of life mentor. 
there's no sectarian Bible. I mean, it's the humanist Bible, right? right? Mm-hmm. Uh, all the no life lessons. Here. No, no, really. I mean, all the life lessons I'd ever want to learn, I, I learned from Shakespeare. So it was just very enriching, deeply enriching. As you said, you then began to do modern work, contemporary yeah. work. Yeah. What was the what was the pull for that? Well, I, I'd always loved doing contemporary work. Of course, I love the classics, but you know, I thought, you know, if I could do some Arthur Miller, maybe they'll think I can act. You know, having seen Shakespeare for ten years. But no, after a while, you know, you sort of want to have uh, a different diet. You know, you want to be able to put your hands in your pocket and and not wear a hat with a feather in it, and uh, you know, sit on the sofa and maybe drink a martini and be, you know, do a contemporary play, <laughs> you know, on stage. So I started to work with Joy Zinnemann uh, uh, and at Studio Theater, and some of my foundational work here in Washington with. Uh, Contemporary work was with her, um, Uncle Vanya. Uh, we did several Connor McPherson plays there, uh, some Mamet, and I, I really enjoyed sort of that breaking out. And then worked on to more political things after that, you know, Nixon's Nixon at Roundhouse. But it was nice to have a balance. My, my favorite day, I think, in rehearsal, we were playing Macbeth at the Shakespeare Theater with Stacey Keach, and I was rehearsing uh, Uncle Vanya during the day. With, with Joy Zinnemann, and to do a contemporary play, of course, the great contemporary dramatic realism with Chekhov, and to do Shakespeare at night, I had a real experience of, the ex- inner experience of both kinds of writers are the same, but in Shakespeare, of course, all the language is completely explicit, and in Chekhov, the language just isn't enough. You know, when Vershinin says to Olga in Act Four, thank you for everything, in Shakespeare, that would be a soliloquy. That would be a long speech. But you have to know all the details, and you know we knew it between each other. So it was just so much fun to do. Right. It's what you have to imply as an actor. Indeed. Yeah, yeah. Now, you've done a lot of plays at Arena Stage. I think yeah. I've seen all of them mm-hmm. <laughs> happily. Uh, most recently, you're in a play called Junk. Yeah. Can you just give us a very brief synopsis? Yeah, Junk is a play by Ayat Akhtar that was uh, at Lincoln Center. It premiered, I guess, a year ago, a year and a half ago or so. It's the story loosely based on Michael Milken and the transformation of the American economy in the in the 80s with uh, turning debt into asset and turning the economic uh, structure upside down, really, uh, and moving away from a, an industrial manufacturing America into sort of a service industry, arbitrage trading kind of thing. It's a, it's a procedural kind of piece. It's a, um, it's a very smart argument about what might be considered to be amoral capitalism versus more personal relationship-based kind of economy, maybe an older kind of economy. And we've all been transformed from American citizens to customers. And that's, Akhtar was examining that period to say, how did that happen? How did we become commoditized? So it's a really interesting conversation about that. I mean, Milken invented a new kind of economy. He overreached, of course, and it's now regulated. You can't quite do that. But the uh, unbridled, amoral capitalism is really what the play is about. And you play a character, Thomas Everson Jr. Mm-hmm. Who, who is that? Tom is the third-generation owner of a steel mill in Allegheny, Pennsylvania, who is the target the Dow, first Dow Jones hostile takeover in American history. And he is the owner of the steel mill that's being targeted, the company that's being targeted by, by Merkin in this case. What he lacks in business acumen, I suppose, he responds with heart and with loyalty to the workers and to the community and the sort of symbiotic relationship between management and labor and building a community as a result, keeping people employed, sort of old-school economy. My dad was... Um, uh, local United Auto Workers president from 1939 to 65. And oh. So he was uh, w- working with Walter Ruther and, uh, as an international delegate and part of the labor movement. And, and then he, his relationship with management was, was fraternal. They were working together. Of course, they had defense contracts. They were making piston rings for World War II. They were de- he was deferred. But that old-school sort of post-Depression idea of American industrial manufacturing, uh, that's who Tom Everson is, and it's a thing of the past. I would think because of your father, this was something that had resonance. Oh, with absolutely you. had resonance. I remember going to the plant as a, a young boy and watching my dad speak in front of the rank and file, mostly women, by the way, and mostly uh, Italian American at the time. This was in northern Jersey. When I was born, they all took up a collection and gave me a $100 savings bond that I then used about 20 years later to pay for my union dues to get back into equity. 
complete the circle there. Full yeah. circle. Yeah, yeah. And not wanting to give away any spoilers here, but Tom also is a deeply flawed hero. Oh, yeah. He's clearly anti-Semitic of the sort of privileged class. He's flawed in that regard. I think there's shades of ageism in him. I mean, he's really an old school kind of guy. Everyone in the play is flawed. Oh. And that's the that's really the interesting part about the play. You, 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 you can empathize, but there's no clear heroes and no clear villains. That's a very smart play. How did you prepare? Read the Predator's Ball. I mean, I was living in Manhattan during the time, and my friend was working on the street in the 1980s. I, I could tell you about New Year's Eve 1980s in Tribeca with a friend of mine who developed the fir- one of the first arbitrage uh, programs for IBM. He had a lovely loft, and it was Bonfire of the Vanities. There was, you know, Miles Davis playing and all kinds of craziness and a lot of Dom Perignon in suits, and you can, mm-hmm. you, can, you can visualize it, right? So I knew what that sort of 17% era was like, you know. It was wild in New York at the time. So there was that to draw from. And just review some of the history and so forth, and the connection with my father and all that. It all, the play is is so well written that as long as you're specific about it, you can just connect to it. It's a language play. It's an argument play. And all of that is about text analysis. And Jackie Maxwell, who directed it, is is a genius. She's a dramaturgical kind of director, and she just she helped layer yeah. this thing beautifully. I was going to say, because I saw it in New York, and mm-hmm. I thought that, you know, the play was changed. Yes, it was. By but, an hour. I mean, an hour has been cut out of it. But the staging was particularly, is so different, and I just love the way it was staged. Well, that's the arena, right? I mean, it's perfect for a four-ring circus, right? And it moves like that. I liken it to those... So it was theater in the round, we should explain. Yes, right. So, right, there's theater in the round, and there are four entrances called VOMs. It works like a chessboard. You'd have camps in either corner, and the whole place sort of starts to move around in circularly. I think of it as uh, like those uh, solar system mechanical models where you have the sun in the middle and all the, the metal pieces with the planets, and they spin... And the moons go faster. That's what it feels like to be on, on that stage. It's like juggling, 70 people juggling, coming on, passing the balls over to the next scene. It moves swiftly and with precision. Uh, and that's Jackie's uh, brilliance. And it, it works beautifully for the play. Oh, the flow is, is really wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. And it actually made me appreciate staging, but also set design. That is a great set design. Yeah. And how that can really help, I would imagine, help you inhabit that character. Well, absolutely. Well, it's really minimalist. Amisha Cash, uh, Cashman, who uh, designed the set, knows that space very well. There are a couple of tables, a couple of chairs, but it's because of the problems of getting on, the time it takes to get on and off, It's there's so many transitions. There, there, there are like 36 scenes and probably 90 transitions. And how do you make that happen seamlessly and lightly? And together with the, the sound and the lighting... It just moves beautifully. It's just suggestions of reality. It's not, you know, it's all done in light with sound that places us, and it just moves effortlessly. So much so, I mean, again, crediting Jackie and the collaboration with the designers, most people don't even notice the design. They get the argument of the play. It's so beautifully put together organically that you don't even notice it. It's, it's, it's really brilliantly done. You're on one on one hand, and Thomas Keegan, who plays Merkin, is right. on the other. Right. And your stories run along parallel lines for the entire play, and then you meet. Yeah. Can you just talk about how you get ready for a scene like that? Because it's a doozy of a meeting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, there's two meetings. One in a the first meeting is in a, a restaurant, and the, the big climactic scene is in a in a board meeting. Well, I had the benefit of having worked with Thomas as a graduate student of mine. So this is the first time we've actually worked together. Uh, and I knew, and I said to him then, I said, you know, when we finally get to work together, it's going to be at a time when you're going to be leading it and I'll be supporting you. I'm sure that's the case. And that's, of course, what's happened. Now, we're dear friends. You know, I would say we're, we're both actors that are in love with language, in love with text, in love with analysis, and we know how to listen to each other and respond as if it were improv. We know what we're doing, so if the pitch is coming a little bit different, we, we can pass the ball. He's, he's just terrific in the role. You've played real-life characters mm-hmm. like Richard Nixon, mm-hmm. as you mentioned, and Rothko, yeah. and even closer to the bone, Antonin Scalia, yeah. especially since he was living as you were playing him and living and working in the same city where you were playing him. Yeah. Can you just tell me how you get your arms around portraying characters like that when you know yeah. they were living, breathing human beings? Yeah, exactly. Well, there's a great 
archive of video material for Nixon and sound, and of course, the interviews and the, the hearings and the recordings and the tapes. And he has such great characteristics that are signature. Rothko was a little bit harder. There's some photographs. Um, he has a written record. He's, he was a great writer, prolific, about his process and so forth. But there wasn't any video. So I just had to draw from photographs. And of course, with, with Justice Scalia, I had the, the remarkable, uh, by a series of unbelievable circumstances, improbable circumstances, that I ended up uh, meeting him, spending time with him in his last full year of court, becoming his friend. And the first time in my career, I played an Italian-American. And I thought, well, this is the great one to start with. As I said to him, you know, Italian-American, Roman Catholic from New Jersey, I've got that. I said, a 45-pound brain, not so much. <laughs> Uh, and we discovered our grandparents are from similar parts of Italy, and I have a likeness to him physically a little bit. And so firsthand watching him work and getting to know him uh, informed it in a way that I couldn't do any other way. It was quite extraordinary. Well, you know, it was life-altering and career-altering, actually. Because you knew him and, and met him, if it were me, I would really have to really battle against wanting to please him. Well, you know, we both had a vested interest, right? I mean, he wanted to show his best side because he knew I was representing him in public as part of sort of a you know dramatic legacy. And I wanted to have a friendship because I wanted to continue to get to know him. So and we both sort of knew that going in. We never talked politics. You know, we talked about families and religion and uh, music and, and language and Shakespeare and the Constitution. So, yeah, and I, he would perform for me. He gave me his best stuff, you know, and he loved it. But And he was very proud to say that, he, you know, he had played Macbeth, and he was the president of the, the, the Drama Society at Georgetown, and Mask and Bauble. Very proud of that. So, yeah, we did have a vested interest in each other. And it wasn't until uh, some decisions came down late in the year that I, I finally said, well, I better. I'd been to several hearings. And then I wrote to him about how I felt about some things, and it was we have lovely correspondence. But I'm, I'm still processing it. It was such an impactful experience. I can see why it would be. Yeah. What was any role, a classical role or a biographical role or a purely fictional role like Tom? What does it take for you to feel as though you got there? Like uh, you really got it? Yeah. I've been a, a reader and a student of Carl Jung and, and Joseph Campbell, and, I, I, and archetypes have helped me, particularly with Shakespeare, because they're, they represent these sort of ideal, you know, that are not stereotypes, but they're sort of energy centers that you begin to sort of contact those, that sense in yourself, right? So that's been the way I've approached character, trying to identify character traits, trying to think, you know, the justice, obvious. King, I mean, you're playing Shakespeare, you're playing kings, you're playing fools, you're playing the, you're playing the major arcana deck. So trying to identify in that sort of Campbell hero journey, how does my character fit? in that sort of larger story. So that's sort of been the way I've approached my entryway into, into characters. And then, of course, it's d defined more specifically by the given circumstances of the play. But Everson is a dad. He's a leader. They're called kings. But he's the debile king, right? It's in the Parsifal myth. He's the, the, the young generation is coming to slay the older generation. Same thing in, with Rothko in, in Red. So... With the with the Scalia piece, it's Scalia, the mentor, and the clerk, the student. That's a old trope, and it's a great sort of structure upon which to tell a tale. Same thing with this play. So I look at try to look at those larger frameworks to to fill in the details. You also managed to uh, give a character like Harry Brock in Born Yesterday. <laughs> I'm not kidding. You gave him a real dimensionality Thank in you. that production. Well, well, you know, again, going to my dad, I, you know, I thought, you know, going from Scalia to Harry Brock, I think his name was Broccolini. It was shortened at Ellis Island. And I went from the smartest Italian-American to the dumbest Italian-American in one year. So, I, you know, still Italian-American. Seriously, but how do you, can you just talk about giving texture to characters who really are unlikable? And Brock, yeah. and Brock certainly was a bully and a loudmouth. Yeah. But you gave him something else. Well, nobody's perfect, right? <laughs> I mean, no, I mean, nobody's perfect, and <gasps> and I recognize that person from that era, who was not my dad, the the men he worked with, or the, the the labor leaders of the time. So I recognize that sort of film noir era, great clothes. But he's funny, and he, you know, no, listen, 
Noel Coward said to Laurence Olivier, he was doing Arms of the Man, he was playing a character called Sergius, and he just couldn't get it. And Coward, who was directing it, said, what's, what's the matter, Larry? And he said, I just, I don't like this character. He's just a jerk. And Coward said, no, 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 dear boy. You must love every character you play, or you can't get on the stage and play it. We're empathy machines, right? Actors are empathy machines. We want to find the humanity in everybody. We want to share that. So we have to find that, whether it's Harry Brock or Iago or whoever it may be. Who's the hardest character for you, or one of the hardest characters for you to love that you played? Oh, Rothko was tough. He was a crank. (sighs) Nixon was tough. Although it was it was written in a way where it's sort of everyone's fantasy, so it was, there was comedy about it, right? Salieri was tough. I mean, these sort of ego-driven. I mean, I guess I, rec- I recognize them, I suppose. <laughs> but you know, I think the probably one of the most difficult ones is the one I'm doing next. It's, I'm, I'm going to uh, attempt my my Falstaff in the fall, having played Henry the King and having played Bolingbroke earlier, and sort of been on that side of the archetype to now go to Falstaff. I never thought about Falstaff. I it never. It wasn't a part that I went. Someday I'm going to get there. And, well, here I am, you know, the old fat guy. And that's a whole different kind of language that I... I, But do you dislike him? Well, you know, he is a bit of... I mean, I love him, and he's a reprobate. Oh, completely, but he... Well, he's a lovable reprobate, right? So, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. That'll be great. I'll be there. I will definitely be there. Thanks, appreciate that. How do you choose the roles that you take? You know, that's changed over the years. I just wanted to make sure I had work. Now... At this stage of my career, I'll talk to theaters uh, once a year, and they'll say, we're doing this. Would you be interested in this project? Or in the case of The Originalist, uh, the play was written with me in mind once once in a lifetime. I like to see who's directing, uh, what the project is, where it's being done. That will pique my interest and my curiosity and, and challenge me, whether it's the role or with a particular director or at a particular theater. Yeah. And is that what you're looking for in roles themselves? Yeah, I want to be challenged, yeah. Absolutely. And at this stage of my career, uh, I'm, I'm sort of squarely in the niche of the uh, the old grumpy old guy, you know, from Scrooge to Rothko to Scalia, whatever, or comedy. There's some great roles that are still available for uh, an older actor. Were your parents theater goers? No. They, no, they weren't. I, I sort of stumbled into it in grammar school and high school. My mother would say, you started out as an altar boy. And then wanted to get the big role. Right? So when I wanted to be a priest, I went, no, it wasn't that. And somebody said, do a play. And I did a Greek tragedy. I said, oh, yeah, that's what it is. I just, I don't want to, you know, I just want to perform. I came from a fairly athletic family, and I, I'm not a great athlete. My dad was. My, so I sort of started that. But it was different for them, right? Uh, I mean, we'd listen to comedy albums at home, or we'd listen to some opera at home occasionally. And, but they were not theater goers. Movie goers, but not theater goers. So they were suspicious at first, you know, because they just want to make sure that I, you know, would have a secure life, I suppose. Which um, and acting is not yeah, it. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> so I think when people start saying, hey, your son's good, that they said that it was okay. And then when I eventually got to New York and was able to pay the bills, they were okay with that. Did you have a aha theater moment that made you think that is what I want? I knew I wanted to be an actor. I had, I had, done a couple of plays as a freshman. I really loved it. It was Greek plays. We did Shakespeare. We had, this was uh, the great flowering, last great flowering of art education in the United States. This was the late 60s, early 70s. We had drama classes. We had speech classes. They were curricularized. They were not considered extracurricular or non-academic. It was part of a re- well-rounded education. So I was very fortunate in that regard. And I would go to New York. We lived close to New York. We'd get on the train, go see plays in Broadway. As as kids, we you know for two bucks you get on the train, you go see a matinee for five bucks. Uh, it, it was great. And then my high school teacher took me to Central Park to see uh, Hamlet with an actor named Stacy Keach, and it was one of the great landmark productions of the 20th century. It was the James Earl Jones was Claudius, Colleen Dewhurst was Gertrude, Stacy Keach was Hamlet, uh, Sam Waterston Laertes, Raoul Julia Osric. I went back five times. And I watched Stacy's performance, and physically it was interesting, it was funny, and then he would speak, and I understood everything he said and had the experience of, I wish I'd said it like that. So I actually got to appreciate Shakespeare's language, knowing precisely what this actor was experiencing. I said, I want to be like that guy. So he became sort of my hero at a distance, and years later he shows up at the Shakespeare Theater, and we're doing Richard III, and every sh- single Shakespeare play... Since then, uh, I was in with him, including his King Lear. 
So when he did King Lear in Chicago, when he brought that to Washington, this was in 2006 and 2009, I was playing as Gloucester. So that was another circle that closed. I was in the right place at the right time, and the right people showed up. I was very, very fortunate. As an actor, can you feel when you have the audience? Oh, yeah. And conversely, can you feel when you're losing them? Oh, yeah. And <laughs> what do you do when you feel like you're losing? I mean, I would try to overact, which well, would you be did, no, the you know, worst exa- thing exactly. ever. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> less, do, do less. Just tell the truth. Just get back to telling the truth. No, the audiences have been, w- w- plays like Red, plays like the originals, plays like Junk. The, the response is immediate. It, it feels like it's in the current news cycle. It feels very contemporary, and they're, they're audible. The, the audiences are gasping and talking back and, no, 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 and it's, it's, it's really terrific. That's my favorite kind of theater. It really is the power of the theater to present ideas, raise the question, don't answer them, and allow the audience to make up their own mind. It's, a, it's, it's just great theater. That, that, to me, is the power of the theater, the place of ideas, the hearing place. I mean, where else do you go where you have to you pay money and everyone listens? They pay to listen. You know, there's nowhere else on the planet where that happens, right? Unless you're going to the movies, I suppose. But actually, let's get together as a community. Someone's going to give tell a story, probably have a different political point of view, and we're just going to take it. We're going to listen to it and figure it out. It's great stuff. Revolutionary, <laughs> right? I want you to build on that and, and talk about what it means to be there and listening and watching, but being in a community of other people who are doing it live and at the same time. Oh, it's remarkable. We have so many people here are, who are working for agencies that are outside talking about the play with relationship to junk and the economy and so forth. You walk into a theater in robes and looking like Anthony Scalia, and it was a, a eye-opening, I think, to many people. But you could feel it, and it's great. And the, 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 listen, there's nowhere, nowhere else in the United States where artists can speak to power directly. They're in our audiences. They're in our neighborhoods. They're in the, our grocery stores. Uh, this, I think Washington really is the Athens of the, of the modern world, where artists from all over the world should come and speak to power. And you, you can't do that anywhere else. You can't do it in New York or Chicago or L.A. And that's what makes Washington unique. We have access like no other place. Tell me a little bit about your teaching. What is it, first, what drew you to teaching, but second, what is it that you try to impart to your students? Uh, Yeah, you know, I always tell them, listen, I can't make you a better actor in 14 weeks. You know, we're going to talk about process. Maybe uh, you'll have questions that you develop your own aesthetic. What do I tell them? In In the guild tradition, I said, I can grade you on work habit. You need to show up. You need to pay attention. You need to tell the truth. You need to let go of the results. So the, sort of the, the path of being an actor requires a certain kind of professionalism, requires a certain kind of curiosity. So I, I just try to provoke curiosity. Bring the water. I can, all I can do is bring the water, right? There are hard skills, of course, to learn. Articulation, text analysis, those are hard skills. In this generation now, I think it's, it's, it's a little more challenging, having grown up in sort of a realistic style in the end of the 20th century and being trained that way. The social media, when I was growing up, were eyes, you looked in somebody else's eyes. That was the social platform. And you had communication with people directly. It's a different thing now. So to get a a young student actor to get used to being with another human being is a challenge sometimes, you know, to just have them look at each other for five minutes and just observe each other, and and it makes them very uncomfortable. They're not used to that. That's what it requires, certainly for the stage, maybe for the film it's something else. But work habit is important to me and assessing where are you now when you begin and let's see how far you come and that, how do you develop. And you have to meet the student where they are and in the best of circumstances find the language that will unlock them in some way where they find how hard it is to get to the place that makes it look easy where you can listen and respond and stop acting. It's, it's hard. <laughs> it's fun, though. It's, it's, it keeps me off the streets. <laughs> <laughs> so what's next? I know you're doing Falstaff. Where where are you going to play it? What theater? And then what comes next? Uh, well, that'll be at the Folger. I'll go back to the Folger. I haven't been there in, gosh, 15 years. And that will open in September. And then I'll return to Arena uh, after that to do Newsies, and do another grumpy old guy called Pulitzer. And then after that, return to the Shakespeare Theater for the first time in uh, about eight years for uh, Much Ado About Nothing. So it's a good season lined up. That's a great season. Yeah, I'm really excited. 
Well, Ed, thank you. I mean, truly thank you. And oh, seriously, pleasure. for so many nights of wonderful theater, Thanks. thank you from the bottom of my heart. Bless you. Thank you. That's actor Edward Giro. Our thanks to Arena Stage for help in arranging this interview. You've been listening to Artworks, produced at the National Endowment for the Arts. You can subscribe to Artworks wherever you get your podcasts, so please do. And if you like us, leave us a rating on Apple, because it helps people to find us. For the National Endowment for the Arts, I'm Josephine Reed. Thanks for listening.